He gave me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. How many can testify to that? Amen. Some of you good singers, you keep it going if I get tied up over here in the keyboard, all right? I thought that we had somebody coming to play, but you're stuck with me again, and I love it. So praise God. <laughs> he, he gave me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. He gave me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that we might be trees of righteousness. Planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. He gave me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that we might be trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. All the ladies, he gave me. circumcision circumcised in the heart amen we worship god how in the spirit sing it you're kind of inhibited okay remember this place is filled with angels whether we see them or not and rejoice that our names are written in heaven above we are the circumcision we are the circumcision we worship god in the spirit circumcision, we worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. We are the circumcision, we worship God in the Spirit. No confidence in the flesh, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. We are the circumcision, we worship God in the spirit. We are the circumcision, we worship God in the spirit. have no confidence in the flesh, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. We are the circumcision, we worship God in the Spirit. We are the circumcision, we worship God in the Spirit. have no confidence in the flesh, and 
We should have confidence in Christ Jesus, and we should have confidence in the Holy Spirit who indwells the heart and life and mind and temple, the body of every believer. But the fruit of the Spirit is not anything of flesh, but love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Oh, beloved, do we need these things in our life? Against such thing there is no what? No law. But we who belong to Jesus Christ will do what? Walk in the Spirit. But in our walking with the Spirit, we will not transgress the law and violate God's Word. But we will hide His Word in our heart that we will not sin against Him. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. You may not know this, but it's real easy. Try it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, love, joy, peace, and patience, patience. Are you with me? Gentleness, goodness, patience. Try the first one, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Again, at part, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience, gentleness, goodness, things there is no law, but we who belong to Jesus Christ will walk in the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, love, joy, peace, and patience, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, against such things there is no law. Song. Isn't that a good one. That's a good way to learn two verses of scripture, or is it one? Help me out. Is that one or two? Two verses of scripture. Is that Galatians 5, 22 and 23? Praise the Lord. That's a wonderful way to learn it, isn't it? That was written by a parent at a school where I was principal up in Norfolk. Who knows? God's probably using you to write songs. So share them with Sonny Gale or me. And if you don't have a tune, we'll find one. And if we uh, need something there to add to it, just share it. And that's how we grow together, the fruit of the Spirit. One last course tonight. 
His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. Most of you know that. If you need it, it's also in the hymn book. Under His name is wonderful. What page? Does anyone have that? If you need it, just tell, shout it out, okay? His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty Sing unto the Lord, your name is wonderful. Your name is wonderful. You are the mighty king. Master of everything. Your name is wonderful. You're the great shepherd. You're the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God, you are. Almighty God, you are. And I bow down before you. I love and adore you. I love and adore you. Your name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. There's one provided for you in the pew there. You know, you just, you just don't really get the benefit of sermons that are expository in nature unless you read the scriptures along with the person who's ministering. So I encourage you to look in the Bible and before you, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up or arrogant on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now if you did not receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. Do you hear this? You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. 
Even to the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure it. Being defamed, we entreat or exhort. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscurring of all things until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some of you are puffed up arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod, or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Terrific passage of Scripture. Such a shame that many people that are out here tonight will not get this message because every Christian should see the importance of this message. In 1 John 2.16, the Bible talks about the pride of life. And here we see in the beginning of this discussion tonight that the people at Corinth thought more highly of themselves than they ought. And you know, there might just be some of us here tonight who think more highly of themselves than they ought also. Because that is one issue or one area that I know I have to work with. And looking at your lives, I think you have a problem with it quite often too. Pride. Being puffed up, thinking that we have arrived in some area of our life. And Paul wants to set the record straight for the Corinthians and for the people here at Open Door Baptist Church, and especially this preacher tonight. And I hope that you'll allow him to speak to you as the Holy Spirit gives utterance. Between the towns of Weehawken and Hoboken, New Jersey, overlooking the Hudson River, there's a stone monument erected to the memory of Alexander Hamilton. You know him. You often see his picture as he comes in and out of your wallet, mostly going out. Who was Alexander Hamilton? He was the Secretary of the Treasurer, and we have honored him by placing his picture on a $10 bill. The monument reads, here on July the 11th, 1804, Alexander Hamilton fell in a duel with Aaron Burr. Some of you remember this as students of history, but maybe you don't know why there was a duel. Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr were political enemies. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Burr killed Hamilton, but it was in fact pride that actually killed Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton was the first Secretary of the Treasury. Aaron Burr was Vice President of the United States from 1801 to 1805 under President Thomas Jefferson. Such great men of influence, such great men of intelligence, coming to such a cruel ending one who lost his life, and one, as you will see, who lost his career, primarily because of arrogance, primarily because of the pride of life. Burr's political career ended when suddenly, as vice president, the vice president of the United States of America killed Alexander Hamilton. Twice Burr ran for the presidency of the United States in 1796 and in 1800. In 1800, he and Jefferson tied, and the U.S. House of Representatives had to take 36 ballots before it chose Thomas Jefferson over Burr. And guess who influenced the election and caused the election to go in favor of Thomas Jefferson? It was Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton used his influence with members of the House of Representatives and caused the defeat of Aaron Burr as the President of the United States. Vice President Burr 
ran for the governor of New York in 1804. Again, he lost due to the successful maneuvering of Alexander Hamilton. Burr was so upset with Hamilton that he challenged him to a duel, and the men faced each other on July the 11th, 1804, at Weehawken, New Jersey. With one shot, Burr fatally wounded Hamilton. Both New Jersey and New York grand juries indicted Burr for murder. But all this was unnecessary. Alexander Hamilton did not have to die. And Burr didn't have to kill him. But their pride conflicted in public and eventually caused them to hurt each other. Hamilton lost his life. Burr lost his future and the respect of all that knew him. The tragedy of this is that Alexander Hamilton was a professing Christian and dueling was totally abhorrent to him. Yet when challenged, Hamilton struggled with what he should do. He knew what God's Word taught. He knew what he believed about dueling. But when he saw that he might appear weak before his fellow men, he decided to take the challenge. He thought that if he did not meet Burr in the duel, that he would be considered a coward and his political future, his reputation would be at stake. So rather than doing what was right, Hamilton yielded to what he felt the pressure of the crowd to conform was. And he died on the very spot where his son had died a year before in a duel. Burr, stung by defeat, disappointment, was determined to get even with Hamilton for hindering him politically. And so he was driven by pride to kill Hamilton. And in so doing, he destroyed his own life, his future. Isn't that tragic that such men of importance could be so consumed by arrogance and pride? And one professing to be a born-again believer and giving great evidence in his writings, in his conversations. The National Gallery of Art in London, there's a large receptacle, a large trash can as you go outside the door. When the doorman was asked how this receptacle was used, since there was no apparent trash in it, he replied, that's where all the young art students drop their conceit as they go out of the art gallery. On December the 2nd, 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte was to be crowned Emperor of France, and he had Pope Pius VII brought to Paris to preside over the coronation ceremonies. The Pope was to place the crown on Napoleon and therefore verify his right to be the emperor. But at the last moment, Napoleon thought the Pope was unworthy to crown him. And so in the midst of the ceremony, the pomp and, and all that was there, he shunned the Pope and he took the crown himself and placed it on his head. Such arrogance. Such arrogance. And yet, we see arrogance and pride constantly in the church today. As you have seen or heard about recent evangelists, preachers who have been caught in building up their own name, building up their own empire to the neglect of those who supported them, to those who had sacrificed for them, even when caught, many of these prominent religious leaders would not admit their involvement or their sin. Such arrogance. It was also arrogance that cost Richard Milhouse Nixon the presidency of the United States. When he refused to accept any knowledge or responsibility of the Watergate break-in. And many have polled countless numbers of people and have found out that the American people most likely would have forgiven Nixon's involvement 
although he was not directly involved with the break-in, he found out about it and was caught in the cover-up. But here again, he thought that he had to save his name, his reputation. But in so doing, he brought dishonor to the presidency and to the United States of America. Pride is such a devastating thing. Paul talks in this chapter about church members who are puffed up, who think that they are better than someone else. And Paul asks some questions, and we need to ask ourselves these questions tonight. Notice that Paul says that he was not crucified for them and that he was not the source of their baptism. And in this chapter, beginning with verse 6, we see that Paul alludes to some things. He says, now these things, what things is he talking about? He's referring to the planting and watering that he referred to in verse 6 of chapter 3. He was referring to the fact that we are all God's fellow workers, that no one should be more highly thought of to the point that others feel displaced. He was talking about the wise master builder in chapter 3, verse 10, and he was talking about being a servant in verse 1 of this chapter. And then he also is referring to the thing that many of us fail to recognize, and I alluded to it at the beginning of the message this morning, that we are all stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just the one who breaks the word from the pulpit or from the Sunday school class, or from the Bible study group, but every Christian is to be a caretaker, a steward, a servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so these are the things that Paul is referring to in this chapter. Why did Paul write this letter to the Corinthians? There were some people there who were upset with Paul because Paul had not been there in a long time. And they thought that Paul was more interested in other matters, and so they began to think that Paul was sliding them. Have you ever heard such a remark about a pastor? Have you ever heard people say that people are not feeding them or not giving them the attention that they need? That's when people in a church or a group begin to think more highly of themselves than others. They think that that 30 minutes to hear about a bunion or some concern that has been continuing on and on is more important than ministering the gospel to someone who has never heard it. And we as Christians can, can be caught up in the same thing that the Corinthian church had here. They thought that they were worth more. And so they were upset with Paul. And so Paul had a purpose in sending this letter. It was to teach the Corinthians some lessons. First of all, he says in this letter, in this particular chapter, that he's sending Timothy and then this letter to straighten out the matter. There were murmurings in the church. And that's the title of the message I shared this morning, murmurings in the church. Aren't you glad that there are no prominent murmurings in the church right now at Open Door Baptist Church? But in the four years minus two months that I have been here, I have heard a lot of murmurings. And so have you. And yet, God is above the murmurings that His people exhibit from time to time. And we should learn from the children of Israel in the Old Testament that God will put up with murmuring so long and then He'll send some fiery serpents or a drought or something to cause them to cry out and ask for mercy and forgiveness. Paul says, I'm sending you Timothy, who is a reliable, dedicated Christian, and I'm sending you this letter to set some things in order. And he says at the end of this chapter that if you don't straighten up, I'm going to give you a rod. But my intention is to give you love. So please see the framework of this passage of Scripture. Paul wants to set this church straight because they're murmuring about Apollos and murmuring about Paul and Cephas, and people are so caught up with popularity. They think this preacher is better than that preacher, or this teacher is better than that teacher. I've shared it before, and I'll share it many times. If you start comparing preachers and teachers and Bible leaders, you're moving into great sin. Because Paul says in this chapter that who are we to think that we are anything? What do we have except that which has been given to us? 
And we should be thankful for everything God has given us through any vessel that God chooses to use. I remember in James Robinson, the great evangelist's testimony about how he received the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He was in a meeting and he was sharing a room with a carpet cleaner, I believe was his occupation. And it was through a carpet cleaner, a lowly profession in many's eyes, that God poured out his spirit in a mighty way to James Robinson. And now James Robinson has been used of God in a mighty way to proclaim the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit today. Well, Paul says in this book that he's going to set the church straight in several areas. First of all, just to allude to the next message that I preach on Sunday morning will be on the morality of the church. Don't miss it. The morality of the church. Because the morality of the church of Jesus Christ today is greatly questioned. Even today I was handed a newspaper article about the gay couple who exchanged vows in Pullen Memorial Baptist Church in our own state. The morality of the church is certainly at question today. So Paul just addresses that in chapter 5. In chapter 6, he talks about Christians who sue each other. And I hope you'll be here for that sermon whenever we get there. And he has topics for all of us throughout this book. And every message is important. And if you miss a service, please ask God to give you the $2 or the time to come by and listen to the messages. Because I believe that God is speaking to Open Door Baptist Church, the study in 1 Corinthians. Paul even gets into the problems in chapter 11 of whether women should wear something on their head when they come to church. I just can't wait to get into all these things. And I know you can hardly wait either. <clears throat> Paul addresses arrogance in the church here. And he says, Who has regarded you Corinthians as superior? Who thought that they were above all these other cities and all these other people? And the conclusion is, only they themselves thought they were superior. What did they have that they did not receive? Paul's conclusion is nothing. I love that song that Mylon Lefevre wrote. Without him, what? I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. I could do nothing without Jesus Christ. Then why did these nothing people boast? That's what Paul's talking about in this chapter. Why do you and I boast about some of the things that we have done or are doing? Because they and we are very foolish. Foolish. And we often act like worldly people. And Paul tells us in this chapter, and I'm telling you as a servant of God tonight, that the church should not be foolish. The church should not act like the world in our dealings. And yet, quite often, the church is even worse in our dealings than people in the world. And Paul says, very foolish, very foolish. Paul says that these people are already filled and rich and kings in their own eyes. What else do they need? And he kind of uses some sarcasm there. and He says, oh, I wish I could reign with you. But you've got to see the sarcasm he has there. The Corinthians acted as though all earthly problems were behind them. They had moved to a spiritual plane where nothing could deter them from becoming spiritually superior to everyone else, as if they were already in the kingdom of God. There are numerous Christians like that today, and I hope that there are none that are taking root in any way in this church because God tells us in His Word that pride goes before a fall and great destruction. And when we think we have arrived, whether as a preacher, a singer, a teacher, a leader of a ministry, we need to watch out because we are nothing without Christ. And when He takes His Spirit from us, we have nothing to boast about. They didn't even understand that the judgment was coming, and Paul had to emphasize that in verse 5 of this chapter. The Christ is coming. In verse 14 of this chapter, Paul says, I'm not writing you this kind of harsh letter to shame you, but to admonish you and to warn you. Is there a place in the church for Christians to correct and warn one another? 
Yes. If we don't do it, we will bring one another to shame. And quite often when we correct one another, we think that someone's trying to put us down or to shame us or to put us on a guilt trip. The only guilt trip that you need to worry about is the one that the Holy Spirit puts you on, and that's when He puts His finger or His light on some area of your life that is in violation of God's book. Paul says, I have written you this letter to warn you. Verse 14, my beloved children, not my brats, not my hated, rejected church members, but my beloved children, I just want to warn you that if you go out there and play on the freeway, you're going to get hurt. How many times have we been told by our parents, or our teachers, our ministers, our government leaders, not to do certain things? And as soon as we get a chance, we go right ahead and do it. Paul says you don't have to suffer shame, guilt, despair, and destruction. Listen to the warnings that the Holy Spirit is bringing forth through me. When you put someone to shame, that's the worldly way. And we've seen a lot of that on television, a lot of it in the scandal sheets, the newspapers. That's the worldly way, bringing shame. Father, a spiritual father. He never calls himself a father, but he calls himself a spiritual father. And therefore he can say, be imitators of me. I exhort you, brethren, be imitators of me, verse 16. Paul wanted them to imitate him. How? Are you supposed to imitate this preacher? Are you supposed to imitate Paul? Paul wanted him to imitate this, these people to imitate him in furthering the cross, teaching people the cross. That's in chapter 1, verse 17. You heard it a few weeks ago. I hope that you remember it. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of the words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Remember I told you that this message was about arrogance and power? And Paul says, if you imitate me, you will lift up the cross of Jesus Christ, and you're going to get something. What is it? Power. Dunamis. Dynamite. If you lift up Jesus Christ and Him crucified and the blood of Jesus Christ, you're going to get power. Not for your benefit and your glory and for your control, but for the glory of the Lord. Paul also says that they should boast only in the Lord. Look at verse 21 of chapter 20, of chapter 1. For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Paul says in this chapter that the only thing that he can boast in is the cross of Jesus Christ. If we're boasting in this preacher or the new orchestra or the choir singing or our Sunday school teacher's efforts or the women's ministry that's getting together finally and really having some victories, if we boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ, we're going to lose the power that God has for us. Do you hear me? Paul says, be imitators of me. And what is he saying to imitate? Someone who loves the cross of Jesus, the gospel of Christ, and someone who boasts not in their own abilities, accomplishments, but in Jesus Christ. They should ground people on the power of God, not on the wisdom of man. That's another thing he, he says that we should imitate him. They should build a ministry that is complementary to Jesus Christ, our foundation. They should live for the Lord's evaluation and criticism, not for the evaluation and criticism of husbands and wives and, and co-workers. But the one person we should be concerned about is Jesus Christ. Are we honoring Him? Are we winning His approval? Are we winning His affirmation? If so, Paul says, imitate me because that's all I want. I'm not interested in whether the people at Corinth love me. I'm interested in whether God is being glorified through me and I have His approval. Yes, we as Christians should seek to correct each other by admonishment, not shame. And Paul could say, imitate me 
because that's the way that I have treated you. I'm not saying, na 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 na. Caught you again. Big headline, big computer banner out in the hall of the church. So and so went back to drugs. So and so's marriage fell apart. So and so is into this immorality or that. Paul says, warn one another, but don't shame one another. These people are complaining because Paul hasn't been there in a while. And you know that old expression, when the cat's away, the mice will play? Well, that's exactly what happened to your car. Paul was the pastor and founder of this church, and he's been gone away for a while, and the people are playing church. We had 17 sermons on that. A lot of you got all upset about those sermons because it went too far. But I want to tell you that every one of them came from the heart of God. Christians, church members, should not play church. We should not play church. The people at Corinth were playing church because their spiritual father, their founder, was out of the picture. And so they started saying, it's all right to do this. It's all right to neglect this. We can do what we blankety blank please to do. After all, we're spiritual. You know, that kind of sounds like Miriam and Aaron when they said to Moses, you're not the only one who can talk to God. You're not the only one who hears from God. And we know that Miriam was struck with leprosy and all of Israel was delayed in their journey because of her sin of pride. God says here in the end of this chapter that... The gospel of Jesus Christ is not built in just words, but in power. And in the conclusion of this chapter, Paul says, I'm not interested in those of you who are so puffed up and arrogant and have all these good testimonies to tell and all these wonderful things that you have done. I'm interested in seeing the power of God in your life. And he says in the latter part, the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. How many of us have seen in recent years a lot of people with wonderful words about Jesus come to public shame and ridicule? And hasn't it distressed us and burdened us and broken our hearts to see that? And you'll see it in the church too. Someone who gave the best testimonies and someone who gave the best lessons and teachings that you've heard in years stumble and fall into sin and go down the tubes. And Paul says, it's not in word that I'm going to evaluate the church, but it's in power. How much power is in your life, in my life? How much power is in the life of Open Door Baptist Church? I went to a concert Thursday night in Hampton. About 3,000 people were in attendance. Steve Green sang and shared in testimony. And the power of God was there. And when he sang, the presence of God, the power of God was mighty, bringing down strongholds, delivering and saving people and restoring people. That's what he's talking about here. We're seeing it in our church. Not because the, the preacher is getting better at his preaching or the music's better, but because finally we're believing that God has power and that he's going to do something. Instead of wringing our hands and saying, oh, woe is me, we've lost another member, or oh, woe is me, uh, these people came and were offended in our service. Hogwash. We should be more concerned about the power of God than what anyone says about this church. And when we're seeing things happen like happened this morning when Paula gave her life to the Lord, that's the power of God the power of God. Paul said like this in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And when this church really believes that and we start sharing the gospel with our family, friends, and strangers in the way, we're going to see more and more of the power of God. 
You know why we're experiencing the power of God in some of our services and in a mighty way? Because many of our people are finally getting off of their blessed assurance and fulfilling the Great Commission that as they go, they're sharing the gospel. People sharing the gospel at the beauty shop, at the grocery store, at the construction site, in the classroom. The power of God, not just words, but life-changing experiences. And we're seeing one another transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ by the power of God. This kingdom of God consists of power. Paul says he would not come in word. It was no longer important what people said, but what was the evidence in their life of the power of God. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Paul spoke of a kingdom power the way he speaks of it at the beginning of his letter. Kingdom power is where the presence of the Spirit of God dwells. Is the Spirit of God dwelling mightily in your home, in your life? in this church? If so, there should be some changes, some dynamite. When dynamite goes off, what happens? Things get rearranged. Things get changed. The power of God. Paul said in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Power in this chapter is what God has accomplished when he redeemed our lives. What change has there been in my life, in your life? Do you know I love to play that piano? And I've had so much fun letting God's Spirit just come in and tell me, try it. You'll like it. I took lessons in high school six weeks and had to give it up because I just could not be responsible in the discipline or did not seem to, to understand that playing the piano takes a lot of hard work. But the Lord knew in my heart that I wanted to play the piano. And I'll never forget when I went to a choir rehearsal one night in Cutler Ridge, Florida, and the pianist didn't show up, and everybody was gathered there, and we had no one to play. And the Lord just spoke to me and said, you do it. And I didn't have any idea, idea what I was doing, but I sat down and, and just started playing. Karen, you were there that night. Remember that? And the song that I first played with confidence was... I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't know why he cared. I don't know why he sacrificed my life. Oh, but I'm glad, so glad he did. And I sat down and started playing that piano. I thought, wow. <laughs> you mean God can take somebody and just give them power over 88 strings, 88 keys? Yes, he can. Because around that time, I heard Andre Crouch give his testimony on 700 Club. And he said that when he was a child, the pianist quit his father's church where his father was pastor. And his father went over and laid hands on Andre and said, Okay, Andre, I'm going to pray that the gift of music come into your heart. And the power of God is going to take over and you're going to play the piano and other instruments. And you're going to write songs and you're going to lead music. A little child. And that pastor prayed and believed in the power of God. And the power of God came on Andre Crouch and he began to play as a little child. And if you know anything about Andre Crouch, he wrote, The blood will never lose its power. Because he had experienced the power of God. He wrote... My tribute to God be the glory, great things he has done. He wrote, I find no fault in him, and hundreds and hundreds of songs, including that song, 
I don't know why Jesus loved me. And when I saw that song and I thought about Andre Crouch, well, if God could do it for Andre as a little boy, what could he do with a guy that was in his 20s who had some musical ability, but all mixed up? And so I have had fun learning to play the piano under the power of God. Now, my wife has quite often thought that I was pushing it. And some of you may have thought that too. But you know, I'm taking Paul's advice. I'm not listening to the criticism of man. I'm just believing that God is going to use these hands with a keyboard. And somehow, I just sit down there and start playing. And some of you must admit, you must be honest in church, that I am improving. <laughs> Not by anything of my own ability, but by my availability. And there are people here tonight who God wants to realize that the power of God is available in your life. It may not be to play the piano, but it might be something else. I knew a guy in college who was a monotone and he wanted to sing. I don't think I've shared this one before, but uh, he wanted to sing for so long and he was horrible. And I went to lead music and revivals and he would preach and, and he would sing and I just want to move away from him. He was so bad. But he, like many people who have had this problem, loved to sing. He sang in the shower. He sang wherever he could. It was off key, but he had a love in his heart to praise God. And then I heard that he went to a church as a pastor and they didn't have a music director. And guess who started leading the singing at that church? He did. Oh, me, what a poor music program they must have. And then I heard him several years later. And God had gifted him above his disability in music. What does God want to do in your life tonight? What power does God want to release? What dynamite does he want to give? What nitroglycerin does he want to put in your hands? in your life, in your mouth, in your mind, in your soul tonight. Not so that you can beat yourself on the chest like the people at Corinth and say, look what we have done. We are kings. We are rich. We are full. We're better than somebody else. But that you can say like Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Power that can do many wonderful things. Power that can take you tonight and put you in the pulpit to preach. Karen, three or four years ago, would never have thought of such a thing. And if her mother were still alive, she would be so ashamed and critical probably because she just didn't think that was ever appropriate. But Karen has preached in this pulpit and in some other places. And the power of God was released through her and many have been blessed despite the criticisms of others, including myself, towards women preachers in the past. We're going to have a woman preacher next Sunday. And my, is God going to use her to speak to my heart? Because I have settled that, that God speaks through whomsoever he wills. And he will also speak to whomsoever listens. the power of God. Even that noise. <laughs> One day <laughs> can be transformed into a mighty praise unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, that was my introduction. That's sincere. I praise the Lord for such a wonderful book, for such a wonderful example in Paul's life of someone who had it all together, who could have been the greatest Jew of his time, 
and yet he was willing to lay it all aside to be beaten, criticized, ridiculed, imprisoned, shipwrecked so that you and I can have that gospel in all of those letters. Aren't you thankful that God can even take intelligent, educated people and use them in spite of themselves? What power does God want to release in your life tonight? Not for your arrogance, but for His glory. Would you stand? Is there some hidden desire in your heart tonight? Maybe you, like me, have wanted to play the piano. <laughs> Maybe you've wanted to sing solos in church. Maybe you've wanted to teach a Sunday school class. Maybe you've wanted to be a soul winner and bring someone to the altar each week who you have won during the week as your trophy for Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to be a soul winner and you just don't have the power in your life. Maybe you want to be able to lay hands on the sick and have the gift of healing. God only knows what's in your heart. But I just believe that if you will seek God's power in one area particular tonight, that God will gift you with His power in that area, if you will use it for His glory. And so, not just to fill up the altar and say, well, we had another good experience at the church tonight, but because I really believe that God is saying this. If there is an area in your life tonight that is the desire of your heart to receive power so that you can fulfill that area, I just encourage you to come right now and stand across the front here so that God can empower you in that area for His glory. And the weaker you are, the more room for Christ to get glory as He gives you that power. What's in your heart? What gift is it? What, what empowerment are you really, truly desiring in your heart? Come even now and say, Lord, if you will give me that ability the power of God in my life, I will use it for your glory and your glory alone. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. It's gift-giving time. It's even greater than Christmas greater than a birthday the power of God the power of God just stand across the front here don't, you don't have to have any humility God knows your heart that's where he's looking just stand across the front here right across the straight line right across the, right across the front here good straight line Part of having authority is being obedient. If you can't follow authority, you won't have much power. Good straight line right across the front of the church. Father, I know that you are working in some lives here tonight. And that everyone that's here, Lord, was especially selected to be here, to hear this message. Concerning pride and spiritual arrogance. And also to hear about power for ministry. Power beyond words. Power, Lord, that will bring people to salvation.